you this morning to the services of a central church of christ here in sarasota florida uh, i decided to come back here into the building to make this uh presentation today uh well there will be some of us who will be meeting in person at this very hour at 10 30 as you're viewing this but we decided to go ahead and pre-record this for you uh, who cannot be with us today it'll be a little easier to do it that way uh, but we are also glad that some of us are able to return and be together in person today and so all of us can gather together in spirit as we do this on this occasion. And so I welcome you to our service today. I'm glad to be here in this auditorium. Again, as I look out and I see nobody here as I'm recording this, uh, I'll try to imagine you being in your place and uh, being back together again very, very soon. Uh, I'm going to be presenting today a, a, a two-part series, or at least I'll begin the first part today, and then we'll finish the, the second part, God willing, uh, next Sunday. I'm calling it the Divine Human Partnership, the Divine Human Partnership. About two weeks ago, I began to pray to God and say, God, what do I need to do? Where do I need to go next? For the last four weeks, we've been talking about the culture of the uh, church needing to be a disciple-making culture and about how if we do not have the right culture within the church, it doesn't matter what strategy we have because because culture always eats strategy. But we also need to have a, a good idea and a good handle on exactly what disciple making is all about. And disciple making is truly a divine human partnership. It is not something that we do by ourselves. In fact, we're not even the primary ones in the disciple making process. We get to we get to work with God in this endeavor, and it's, a, it's an exciting and amazing thing to think that God has called us into partnership with himself. And so today I'm going to focus a little bit more on the Jesus partnership of this equation, and then next week we'll talk a little bit more about the Holy Spirit partnership, although it's very difficult to separate Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this divine human partnership. You know, 
King David mused about 3,000 years ago in Psalm 8, verses 3 through 8. He said these words, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beast of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and all that swim in the paths of the sea. David just could not hardly wrap his head around the idea that the God who created all this wonderful nature, this universe that we see around us, he could not quite imagine how that God could be mindful of you and me. How God could even care about you and me. God is so big. He is so vast. He is so self-sufficient. Why does he need to even think about us? Much less partner with us in the work that he wants to do. But even in regard to this physical universe, God has put us in charge to manage the things of this earth. He has made us ruler over the works of his, of his hands. And we have been given a great task to do in partnership with God. How amazing is it that God who created the heavens and the earth, who needs nothing from us, decided to partner with us. Jesus' very incarnation is evidence of this divine human partnership. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 he says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14. Even in Jesus Himself there was a divine human partnership because Jesus was all God and all man. And so we see it all come together in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's an amazing thing to think that God, when he thought about partnering with us, he wanted to make himself even a man so that he could identify with us who are on this earth. As God became man, Jesus speaks of his own partnership with his heavenly father while he was here on this earth. In John chapter 5, verses 17 and in verse 19, Jesus says, My Father is always at His work to this very day, and I too am working. I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by Himself. He can do only what He sees His Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Jesus is telling us right there that not even he, while he was on this earth, could do anything by himself. He could only do what his father was doing. He declared that both of them were at work to this day. There was a divine human partnership, even with Jesus and the father, while Jesus was upon this earth. Can there be any less with us and the father? Jesus demonstrated his absolute dependence on God the Father and the work that they did together. In John chapter 5, verse 36, Jesus says, I have testimony weightier than that of John for the very work that the Father has given me to finish and which I am doing testifies that the Father has sent me. Even the work that Jesus was carrying on was a divine human partnership. It was work that God gave him to do and that God was doing through him and with him while he was upon this earth. This concept of fellowship, we use that word quite a bit, but the idea of fellowship is really partnership. It is a sharing in something. It's having things in common. John spoke of this in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. John himself realized that if 
people after him, coming along after him, were going to be able to do the work that God called them to do, that they had to do it in fellowship with the Father and with the Son. It was a divine partnership between man and God. And it's just so exciting to me to think that we have this ability to have the very God of the universe and His Son, Jesus Christ, as our partners in the work that we do upon this earth. One of the most amazing facts about our relationship with God is our being able to be fellow workers with Him. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians when he says, What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through Though uh, through you, uh, uh, through you who came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor." For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. When Paul was trying to explain what he was as an apostle and what Apollos was as an evangelist, he explained it in terms of being servants of God and being God's fellow workers. He compared it to going out in the field where one would plant the seed, one would come along and water the seed, but God is the one who makes it grow. That is the divine human partnership that we're talking about today. When I decided to preach the gospel, I said no to the music business. I, just, I thought at one point in my life I might want to go to Nashville, Tennessee and be a part of the music business there in Nashville, Tennessee in some capacity to work behind the scenes in the music business. Perhaps, you know, I, I thought, well, how great it would be to work with some of my music heroes like Merle and Alan and Vince and Johnny and Willie and George. And if you have if I have to give you the last names of all those people, then you're probably you, you're probably not a country music fan. I would have to I would I would have loved to have been the studio in the studio assisting in the recording of their many records or booking events for them around the world or promoting their music to the world. I would have loved to be able to do that, but that wasn't my calling. I also said no to the legal profession. How great would it have been to rub shoulders with attorneys and judges within the community, to be at the center of life and death decisions where the destiny of people were being decided? But I decided to take another position to be able to work alongside day in and day out with the greatest person who ever lived. And that was Jesus Christ. I get to go to work every day with Jesus. The shingle on my door reads Jesus and Associates. And I'm just merely one of the Associates. Oh, it would have been great, maybe, to rub shoulders with some of the country music greats of all time. It would have been great, maybe, to rub shoulders with attorneys and judges. But how much greater is it to rub shoulders with Jesus Christ and be in business with Him? I want to share with you two passages that talk about this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, this partnership that we have with Him. The first is found in Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. At this time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In this short passage, Jesus is proclaiming at least three things about our divine human partnership. First of all, I am glad that I don't have to qualify for the position of partner with Jesus. I am not one of the wise. I am not one of the learned. I am not one of those that Paul talks about in, in the uh, book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where he says, you know, where is the scholar? Where is the wise man of this age? He says that when you were called, not many of you were wise. And I certainly fall within that category of not being anything particularly special in this world. But I am glad I don't have to qualify for partnership with Jesus Christ. I am glad he doesn't look at my resume and say, well, I don't think I can take you into the firm. I am glad that that Jesus wanted to partner with even the least of these. And secondly, I am glad to be working with the only one who knows the secrets of God and is willing to reveal them to me. You know, perhaps if I had gone to Nashville, Tennessee, and I started in the business not knowing very much, there may have been some kind-hearted soul who would teach me the ropes of the business who would reveal to me all the secrets and all the ways you get business done in Nashville, Tennessee. Perhaps if I had gone into the legal profession, I would have had somebody who would come alongside of me, an older attorney who would say, let me show you how this is done. And he would reveal all the secrets of the trade and how you get things done within the legal system. But I got a better deal than that. Because I come alongside Jesus, he comes alongside of me, and he says, Son, let me tell you how it works. Let me tell you how it works in the kingdom of God. I'm going to reveal to you all the secrets of God. And you're going to partner with me. And I'm going to make you a partner in this business of mine. And thirdly, I am glad to be in a yoke with Jesus. Someone who understands my weaknesses and understands my burdens. And he pulls me with me, providing rest for my soul. I am glad that Jesus decided not simply to say to me, look, here's how this partnership is going to work. I'm going to stay over here and every now and then I'll check on you, but I'm going to see how you do the work that I call you to do. Now, I'll check up on you every now and then and see how you're doing, but I hope you do a good job. Uh, But that's not how he did it. He says every day we're going to put the yoke on. You're going to be on one side, I'm going to be on the other, and we're going to pull together. We're going to set the pace together. And I'm going to lead you, and I'm going to be there for you when you get tired, and when you're burdened, and when you're weary. I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be in the yoke with you, and we're going to be pulling together. And you will find rest for your soul in that kind of partnership. I am so glad that that is how Jesus envisioned the partnership between me and him. And then in Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 28, we'll go down into chapter 2, verse 3. There's a passage here where Paul explains in his ministry how he also partnered with Jesus in the work of God. He says, we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we might present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me yet or personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The job is incredibly big. That's one of the points that Paul is trying to make here. It is such a big job to work with people and to try to help them so that one day you can present them to God, to to present them uh, as people who are perfect or complete in Christ or mature in Christ. That is such an incredibly big job. 
I am, God, I am glad that Jesus did not say, okay, I'm going to give you this job. I'm going to give you a group of people, and, I, and your job is to make sure that one day when you stand before me in judgment, you're going to present these people to, to me one by one and say, God, I work with these people, and they are mature, they're complete, they're perfect in, in Christ. But he didn't say that he was going to do it that way. He says that I'm going to do it and I'm going to give you the energy to do it. And so secondly, the job is made doable because of Christ's energy that works in me. There is no way that any of us can do what God has called us to do unless the energy of God is in us to do this work. I am so grateful that his blessings and his mercies are new every morning. That I can work for him and I can get tired and sometimes I get frustrated and sometimes I just don't know what to do. And I can go to sleep and I can wake up and I can start a new day with fresh energy from God to do the work that he calls me to do. I am glad, glad that he doesn't just wake me up and he said, boy, it's time to go to work again. I'm glad he says, look, I'm going to be the fuel in your tank I am going to be what gets you through the day. I'm going to be with you and in you, and I am going to provide everything you need to get this job done. I am so grateful that that's how God operates. And then thirdly, the work product is incredible. That when God works with you and in you and through you, and Jesus is your partner in the work that you do, the work product is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is not only Christ in you, but Christ in those people that you work with. To be able to see Christ being formed in people, almost as a baby being formed in the womb, growing, and that person growing with Christ to maturity, is a wonderful, wonderful work that we are called to do. It is so incredible to me that God wants to partner with us human beings in the work that he has prescribed on this earth, a work that is heaven and hell, it is eternal, it is life and death, it is the most important work that can ever be done. There is no work on the face of this earth that is more important than the work of making disciples. For the past four weeks, I have talked about the disciple-making culture that is needed to promote and sustain the strategy for growth. Lest someone get the idea that this is merely a human endeavor, it is essential to understand the divine human partnership that is required. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are not merely commanding us to go to go get it done. They're calling, uh, they're calling out to us to join them in the work that they're already doing. How wonderful it is to show up for work each morning and Jesus is standing at the door waiting on us with a full day's work laid out before us and the excitement of seeing the will of His Father done on the earth as it is done in heaven. No sleeping in for me. I love going to work. I love being able to see Jesus in my mind, standing at the door saying, come on in, we've got a lot of work to do today. I've got it all laid out. I know how we're going to accomplish this. I know what we're going to uh, do today. And I'm going to show you how to do it. And I'm going to be right there with you. And I'm going to be doing the work with you. That is so incredibly exciting to me. Why, as Christians, do we get into this feeling that somehow God is just simply in heaven throwing out command after command after command and saying, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this, and we're weighted down by the burden? That is not how God operates. God is right here with us. God is doing the work with us. God is more involved in the work than we are. God is pulling more weight in the work than we are. It is in the scheme of things a small thing to plant a seed, to water the seed. But who among us can make it grow? None of us can give the increase. Only God can do that. 
And so every day when you get up, I hope you will have a renewed vision for how God can partner with you in this work of the ministry that we have before us. Again, it is an exciting thing for me to think about how that God has arranged the kingdom of God to be. You know, I think sometimes we do get burdened down because we think we're alone. Or we think we just need other people to prop us up. And you know, I appreciate and I long for the day we can be back together. We can personally encourage each other. But my primary strength and my primary energy and my primary encouragement comes from God himself. He is the one who is with me every day, every morning. There is no social distancing with God. He is not standing six feet away from me. He is often carrying me in his arms to get the work done. He, Jesus is yoked together with me. And I don't think we even have to wear masks. I believe that we're in this together and that we're working together. And it's an incredible, incredible journey that we are on. And so I hope you catch the vision today of the divine human partnership and that you will become excited enough about it to say, God, what do you want me to do? What are you doing? Show me what you're doing. I want to enter into the work that you have called me to do. And you'll be blessed because you are. Well, in a few moments, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. I hope you will remain in online and that you will take the Lord's Supper with us. We have, again, an incredible partnership even in the Lord's Supper because we're not even just communing with each other. We're communing with God himself. It is certainly a celebration with him that Jesus said, I will take it again in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is celebrating with us. And so in a few moments, we will gather again after we have a song to prepare us for the Lord's Supper and that we will have that time together in doing that. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you. Take care. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the Well, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper now together. And I would uh, direct your attention to a couple of verses in the book of Isaiah. And it will be in Isaiah chapter 7, one verse there. And then we'll go over to chapter 9 for a couple of more verses there. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7 is uh, in the middle of a prophecy that God is giving about the coming of the Messiah. And in the days of Ahab the king, Ahab was being confronted with some army, armies that he was afraid were going to overrun him. And so he was seeking partnership with some other nations in order to uh, defeat these armies. But God told him not to do that. God wanted him to depend completely on him for deliverance. And so he told Ahab to ask for a sign so that he could prove, God could prove to him that he would be with him in this battle. But Ahab very stubbornly says, I'm not going to ask you for a sign, God. I think he already had his mind made up what he wanted to do. But God says, well, I'll give you a sign anyway. And so the sign was, as recorded in verse 14, um, he says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now, this is what we call a double prophecy because the prophecy and the fulfillment of it for Ahab was within his day because just a few years after that, the threat of these other kingdoms as this child grew up and was winged, it says a little bit later on, 
that this child was evidence that, um, that the, the threat was going to pass and that he did not need to enter into a partnership with these other nations. But, he, but the other part of the prophecy is, is for Jesus himself, because Jesus is the son that's talked about in verse 14. And he is the one who will be called Emmanuel, or God with us. But then over in chapter 9, beginning in verse 6, the prophet says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now I want you to actually focus on that very last phrase that I just read. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. You see, when Jesus was sent into this world, it was because of the zeal of, the God, of God Almighty that accomplished that. It was when Jesus lived a perfect life upon this earth, it was the zeal of the Lord Almighty that accomplished that. When Jesus was led to the cross and was victorious over sin, it was the zeal of the Lord that accomplished that. And certainly when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was the zeal of the Lord that accomplished that. And then as Jesus ascended back to heaven and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, as it talks about in this, and received that government that would never end, that kingdom that would never end, it was the zeal of the Lord that accomplished that. And so here we are today. All that God has accomplished down through human history in order for the kingdom of God to be a reality in the earth today and in order for us to be here in the kingdom celebrating the Lord's Supper with Jesus is truly amazing because it was the zeal of God that accomplished it. What is the zeal of God? What is it about God being zealous do you know the word zeal and the word jealous is really the same word? And we're told that God is a jealous God. That's why he does not want any other gods before him. He's a jealous God. God has such a zealousness and jealousness, if you will, for his people and for his kingdom and for accomplishing what he wants to accomplish on this earth, that he, his zeal is like fire that burns his zeal is like uh, burning embers that just will not be quenched and will not be put out we are told in Romans chapter 12 that we are to live in the zeal of the Lord that our zeal needs to be evident in the Lord as well because again just as we talked about in the message we are partnering with God he is zealous for his work but we are also zealous for that work as well that's why it's such an amazing thing to come around this table and to celebrate what God has accomplished not just in the cross not just in the resurrection but from the beginning of time down to this present day what God is accomplishing in our very lives and that's what we celebrate is that our God is so zealous and that we are zealous with him and we are re upping if you will we are signing up again today we are going back into the fields today we are saying to God again today God I am zealous for you just as you are zealous for me so as we take this Lord's Supper today I want you to remember what the zeal of God has accomplished and it's accomplishing amazing things I hope it's accomplishing amazing things in your life because our God is a God who will not let you go. He is so committed to you. He is so for you. He does not want to see anyone perish, but everyone to come to a knowledge of the truth. And he wants every one of us in the sound of my voice today, as we celebrate this Lord's Supper, to remember that our God will go to 
every length in order to save his people. And he has proven that by what he did on the cross and in the resurrection of Jesus. And so today, let's pray together as we take this bread. Our Father God, thank you for your zeal. Thank you for being so committed to us that you sent your son and that he offered his body up as a, as a sacrifice on that cross so that we could live. And so as we take this today, Father, bless us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The zeal of God is also found in the blood of Christ. When Jesus died on that cross, he poured out his blood. He shed his blood on the cross. And that blood was given for all of us, one time for all of us. He was so zealous for us that he was not willing to hold anything back. His last ounce of blood was drained from his body. And that blood was given for, given for you and me. It's because Jesus was all in. He was zealous for what God was zealous for. And he was willing to bleed out for us. And so let's pray. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Christ. Thank you for what it accomplishes in our lives. Thank you, Father, that that blood never stops being effective. It is always effective. People are still being saved today by the blood of Christ. And I pray that we will be zealous in our lives for his blood. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for celebrating the Lord's Supper with us today. Uh, if you are a member of the Central Church of Christ, you can go online to centralsarasota.org and you can make a contribution online or you can mail it in here to the church. But thank you for uh, being faithful and sending in your contributions. I know it's more difficult this way, not being here, but we do need your financial support. All the ministries of the church are still going on, both our foreign missions and our local work that we're doing here. And we just need you to be faithful and, and be a part of this work every day. So again, God bless you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body. It's great.